Hello everyone, you're listening to the Information Playground, brought to you by Ron Bush Consulting. We're the underwriters for the, the program. Uh, if you're listening to us in Northwest Indiana, you're probably listening to us on WVLP. Uh, that's a, a very fine FM radio station in Valparaiso, 103.1 FM. And uh, I hope you're streaming because it's WVLP.org. Very easy to do. They're an excellent uh, radio station in addition to the community. And you can get involved in the community with them if, you, if you'll go there. You may be listening to us on demand. Uh, and uh, by the way, WVLP is 9 a.m. on Mondays and 1 p.m. on Fridays. So uh, on demand, we are available on podcasting, on Spotify, um, uh, Apple Podcast, uh, Google Podcast, and a host of others. Uh, also, we're available on YouTube. Both channels for podcast and YouTube are The Information Playground. So thank you for being with us today. We've got a great guest today. This is John y Yanarelli. Uh, he's a, a retired FBI special agent, and he's got a great story to tell. We're going to have a great conversation. With that, John, if you would, uh, welcome, first off, and uh, tell the folks a little bit about you. Well, Ron, thanks for having me today. So my life started off in law enforcement years ago. I was a San Diego police officer, and I wound up going to law school nights to get my law degree, practice law for a while. And with that law degree, I was able to join the FBI. Spent 21 years in the FBI with a wide variety of assignments, uh, many different offices I was assigned to, and many interesting postings. I was the spokesperson for the FBI, the Oklahoma's bombing, and the 9 11 attacks, and a lot of cybercrime along the way. Hopefully, today I can share some good information with your listeners. Excellent, excellent. Well, uh, we'll be looking forward to that. Um, with that, let's uh, let's start with where we're at. We're uh, we're recording this in the middle. I don't know if it's the middle, but I hope it is the middle or the end of the uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so there's all kinds of uh, cyber scams going on. Uh, let's talk about some of the latest ones. Uh, why don't you lead us off? Ron, it's amazing. You know, we have enough problems with this pandemic, and yet the criminals out there, they do what they do best. They try to take advantage of us when our guard is down or we're preoccupied with something else, and they are actually using this COVID pandemic to try to perpetrate these crimes. What we're seeing a lot of is scams, for example, very basic, sending emails, hey, the latest news on the COVID outbreak, what you need to do to keep yourself safe. What do we do? We click on those links and they're downloading malware into our computers, enabling them to see everything you do on your computer, every website you go to, every keystroke you type. What that means is, you go to your bank account, you type in your username and password, suddenly the cyber criminal has that information and can take advantage of you. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm often, uh, I guess, surprised when I speak to groups about this very thing and I start telling them the things that happen uh, that, that cyber criminals do and they look so, so astounded. And I, and I say, you know, they're criminals. You, you expect them to be, act like Boy Scouts? Uh, ransomware, perfect example. One out of five um, cyber criminals that get paid after uh, for ransomware don't send the decryption key. And and again, I tell people that, and and they're astounded. Do you expect them to keep their word? They're criminals. So, yeah, who would, have, who would have ever thought criminals have honor and integrity? Uh, <laughs> That's right. I think the old uh, phrase is, there's no honor among thieves, and that's still true. Exactly. I tell all my clients and folks I come in contact with, if you're ever a victim of ransomware, I advise do not pay the ransom because there's no guarantee you're going to get your access back to your data. And even if you do, who's to say they're not going to come back and with a secret, they have somewhere system lock you up again what I have found time again in the FI these criminals will share information with their criminals so if Joe Smith paid the ransom next thing you know every cyber criminal out there knows that Joe Smith is willing to pay that's right best bet is 
back up your information. Make sure you have all your files saved. So if God forbid you do become a victim of ransomware, you can just reboot your computer, format the hard drive, and put all your information back on. You're back in business. Excellent. That's uh, we're uh, we're we're uh, preaching to the choir to each other. I hope our, our listeners take uh, take note. So. Um, Leveraging the hype and fear, how is it that uh, that cyber criminals are doing that with COVID-19? I mean, they do it all the time. The the, the phishing emails we get, either our account's been hacked or, uh, uh, you know, it might be cute puppies. Instead of fear, it'll be uh, curiosity or, or something like that. How are they? How are how are they doing it in this new environment? They're doing a couple of different things. So we're seeing the phishing scams I had mentioned where they're purported to put out good information to keep you safe, but really it's nefarious viruses on your computer. They're also taking advantage of you in different ways. Time of parano and people are sitting at home. Now they are sending out email scams saying, we have your password, your user ID. We know exactly who you are and where you live. And what they'll do is share with you your username and password to convince you, the viewer, that they actually do know who you are and where you are. Now, the reality is your password and your username was not hacked from you, but from some other hack that happened long ago. And all that information is sold on the dark net. So anyway, they'll come back to you and say, as proof that we've hacked you, Here's your username. Here's your password. We have the COVID virus. And if you don't pay this ransom, we're going to come to your home and infect your family with this deadly disease. People think, how else would they have my information unless they knew who I was? And they will panic and pay the money to keep themselves safe. Again, it's just another variation of the old Nigerian scam it takes different iterations and forms. Today, they're using COVID-19 to try to steal your money. Yeah, yeah. They, I think that I've not heard a number, but I've heard uh, in several from several different sources that um, the number of new websites with coronavirus or COVID-19 in it is just off the charts. The scammers are, are creating those websites as fast as they can to dupe us into going there so we can either get infected there or become part of their scam there. It just amazes me. You know, one of the things we can do to be safe is we all want to get good information and we want to get timely information. If you receive an email with a link to information, don't click on the link. It may be legitimate, but if it's from the CDC or your state government, go to their website directly. Mm -hmm. It'll be very noticeable where the link is that you need to click on to get that information. Don't the chance because the criminals make emails look legitimate. They may have even hacked into the government's emails or private sector email. There was a time where there was concern that they were taking advantage of John Hopkins Hospital by capitalizing on all the emails being sent out with information, sending wrong URLs is that wrong suspected to malware and go directly to the site, take that extra step and that will keep you safe. Excellent. I go a little step further with clients and when I speak to people, I say, if you didn't solicit that email, if you didn't ask for it and you don't know them, just delete it. You didn't ask for it. It's like junk mail. Stand where you stand over the shredder and shred your junk mail. Do the same thing with the email. Get rid of it. Nothing makes me happier and more proud than one of my clients will contact me and ask, hey, did you send me this email? There's nothing wrong with checking on that. And I totally advise that's the way we need to do business. If you get a link that you think may not be legitimate, listen to that inner voice. Just recently, I had my accountant send me an email with a link to fill out information for taxes. Well, I took the time to give him a call. Lo and behold, it was a scam. Somebody had compromised his email, and he wasn't even aware of it yet. 
Oh it's this kind of information that you want to take advantage of to keep yourself safe so the criminals don't take advantage of you. Oh, gosh. Excellent illustration. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, you know, whether we're talking spear phishing, uh, it, which is real common among CEOs mm -hmm. uh, in larger companies where they may not see each other every day. Uh, maybe the CEO is overseas. Maybe he's on a, on a trade mission or maybe he's on vacation. Doesn't matter. There's all kinds of, of, uh, of stories uh, about uh, uh, where the, the uh, accountant setting, uh, the C, uh, CFO is sitting in the, in the office. He gets the email, wire money. We've got an opportunity I can't miss. And he wires $20 million, $60 million. Does the, the amount can be just depends on the size of the business. Whatever is realistic to that business, he wires it. And all he had to do was pick up the phone and call his boss and say, did you send this? Just exactly what you were talking about. It's called the business email compromise. I see a lot of that. What I will tell you is we have had some good success in getting the money back. So if it unfortunately does happen, pick up the phone and give me a call right away because we can track the money. I had one case where someone in the Arizona area had wired $3.2 million to their title company because they were purchasing a rather large home the money went overseas we were able to track it we got every penny of that money back but the key is timing you got to do it within 72 hours otherwise that money is gone and been dispersed all over the world yeah oh that's great while we're talking about that if people do have questions or they maybe they they're in this kind of situation and they want to get in touch with you what's the best way for them to do that I'm very easy to find. My website is fbijohn.com, and I encourage people to follow me on Twitter at fbijohn. Every day I put out a tip to keep you safe, whether it's cyber, active shooter, or even terrorism. You'll get a little tidbit every day, something you should know to keep yourself and your family from harm. Excellent. I may sign up for that. I'm, I'm probably something there I can learn. So that, excellent. Excellent, John. So I know you've written books. Let's pause for just a minute and head that direction because I read the one on the how to spot a terrorist. Um, you've written four other ones. By the way, how to spot a terrorist was excellent. Uh, great information. If you want to talk a little bit about that, you're more than welcome to, but tell us about the others as well. Sure. And, uh, you know, anybody think I've come on here today to hawk books, I, I will tell you the, the publishers make all the money in the book world. <laughs> I have sold thousands of books and made hundreds of dollars, but <laughs> I will tell you, so for years and years in the FBI, we're telling people, if you see something, say something. No one ever told us what for. So I wrote a book, How to Spot a Terrorist Before It's Too Late, outlining the things that law enforcement looks for. We call them indicators and putting their 10 simple indicators that any can notice when we go back and look at terrorism cases after the event has happened, there's always a sign of these indicators. For example, the folks that were in uh, uh, San Bernardino that attacked an office at a Christmas party, neighbors had observed them uh, loading weapons and magazines in their garage at the time. Uh, that's a little suspicious activity. Likewise, they were posting things on social media but nobody wanted to report it thinking, well, it's free speech that can do what they want. Those are two different types of indicators of behavior. If you pass it on to law enforcement, we're not gonna go out and arrest anybody. We'll do some record checks. Maybe they're already on our watch list. Maybe we're looking at them in some other investigation and that's more evidence to help make a case. Or maybe we're just gonna go knock on a door, not say who told us, but hey, we have some concerns. Can you help? put our fears aside by telling us why you're working in your garage at three in the morning, loading magazines, simple little tips like that, that anybody in the public can spot, hopefully prevent that next terrorist attack. Well, that's excellent advice. And it was a well-written book, good illustrations. Um, you know, I, I read the other day that there are less than 3 million law enforcement officers in this country, in a country of 350 million people, everyone should realize they're part of it. If the, the saying you just said it, if you see something, say something, that applies to all of us. 
you can't be everywhere. Law enforcement can't be everywhere, not in this country. So the reality is, you know, uniformed law enforcement alone, and that includes the plainclothes detectives, et cetera, there's only about 850,000 of those. And then we have the federal agencies as well, like the FBI. The FBI is in 65 different countries in addition to the United States, but we only have 12,000 agents. So when you think about how far spread out we are, yeah. we can't do it alone. It's all about the public helping us out. And that's not just in terrorism, it's cybercrime as well. If somebody has done something to you or tried, unless you tell us, we're never gonna know, that person may go on and try it again against another person and that person's gonna be a victim. We need the public's help in solving crime and preventing crime. Now, I used to tell, uh, when I present or, or in speaking to people or even in writing, I would tell people to call their local FBI office and then that switched to IC3.gov as cybercrime just continued to explode. Is that still the best thing to do if, uh, if something happens to you or you see something? What's the best, best process? Well, for your folks out there, so IC3 is the Internet Crime Complaint Center and ic3.gov is the website. If you've been a victim of a crime or are aware of something that's cyber related, you can go there and log that information in. Rather than having agents all over the country work similar matters, IC3 takes all the information, we compare it to find same cases with the same subjects, and we can focus the resources. Rather than having 10 agents work 10 small cases, There'll be one person focusing on all 10 cases involving that particular subject. Report that information. At the very least, it's good for statistical reporting purposes. The FBI can only do what Congress will let them do, and we need to let them know how much crime we have. For example, IC3 is currently receiving about 22,000 complaints a month. Think about the, in the context of what I just told you, only 12,000 agents who are working terrorism, bank robberies, frauds, extortions, kidnappings, and cybercrime. We can be stretched a little thin in law enforcement. Again, we need the public help. Well said, well said. I had no idea that it was that many complaints on a monthly basis. I just made a note. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about nation states. Um, we hear about China, North Korea, Russia, um, I don't know, I've read quite a bit about terrorist organizations like Al-Qaeda, um, even ISIS uh, have, uh, have recruited uh, cyber terrorists. Um, I'm gonna assume Iran probably has a, a part to play in this. What should, we, what should we be looking for? How can we help and how can we help not be a victim, but be a part of the solution? Well, you're very astute to talk about Iran, and Iran seems to fly under the radar in our media and other things. They are probably one of the largest purveyors of nation state attacks against the United States. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about just attacking our military or things like that. Iran knows if they want to crush the United States, they need to crush the private sector. You know, the COVID virus has done more to hurt the United States in the past month than all these foreign nation states have been able to do in decades. Right. But our business will come back. Likewise, these countries recognize they need to target the private sector. So if they can hack into a business and put a business out of business, that's good for them because it's bad for our economy. Mm -hmm. They're pinging our critical infrastructure. Think about here in Arizona, what would it be like if the dam wasn't working and water wasn't running anymore? Or during the summer, we didn't have electricity because the electrical grid is compromised and there's no air conditioning for a week. Gas pumps don't work and we can't get fuel to leave the area. These are things that the enemy knows they can do to us. They are actively working on it on a daily basis. Aside from Iran, China is another of the major problems we have and what's particularly bad is in the midst of the COVID crisis, which originated in China, China is taking advantage of it. They are one of the very first purveyors of putting out false information allegedly to be COVID warnings, but really downloading malware. 
so that they can execute it into your computers. Part of the end game here is everyone's working from home. So if I'm downloading this and I download malware on my personal computer, but now I'm logging into the office web page or network for the office, I'm spreading that malware. So China is just, we're gonna capitalize and go after businesses doing this. We have to be very careful who is out there and what they're after. That's really, that's really the issue. I remember when uh, the war on terrorism, as, as it's become known, first started, uh, the, the, uh, the saying, uh, we have to be, they, could, they only need to be right once. We mm -hmm. need to be right every time. That has trans, transformed into this. All of us need to be right every time. It's hard to tell a, a fish or a spam uh, email or, or even a, a phone a voice, which is called uh, Vish, uh, even text. You know, I get all of them. I assume everybody else does too. Uh, it's hard to sometimes tell whether they're real or, or they're a scam. Uh, it's, it's hard to know if, it, if that's a, a robocall or if that's an actor behind the, the scenes that's, that's uh, trying to do something, whether it's uh, financially affect you or, or, or something else. Uh, and honestly, just about every crime you can do physically, uh, it can, most of it can be done or facilitated over the web. So uh, personal safety might even come into play. Stalking can be done on, online. So it's, it's hard to deal with that. It's hard to know. And I wish, uh, well, let me ask you, do you have some advice in that area? Let's go that direction. Absolutely. So all the things you mentioned are actively going on, especially with bullying, stalking. The internet has made it an environment now where all of these negative and criminal things can occur at any time of the day or night, and there's really no relief from it. What you have to do is, and you have to be very careful of anything you receive that may be suspicious about. As I said before, somebody I knew sent me a URL, but it just seemed strange. It was out of character, what we normally do, and I took the time to call because I'm in the and I know that we all have to cause like that. Uh, there is no substitute for picking up the phone. I won't wire money any longer unless I get a phone confirmation of exactly what the warning instructions were. Because this is all criminals have time to do. They mm -hmm. sit around and wait for those moments. If you're buying a house or making any major purchase, they look for that email traffic so that they can jump in and tell you, Here's the login to use your credit card and how you can pay, et cetera. Mm -hmm. All of this information they're stealing, they're not stealing just for themselves either. You go to the dark web, you can find all of this information. There is a virtual Amazon for criminal activity on the uh, dark net where you can just say, I want to buy credit cards and type in what you're looking for and you'll come up with literally thousands of sites that sell stolen credit cards. Mm -hmm. The question we often get is, well, why doesn't the FBI do anything about this? Problem is, most of these websites are coming from places outside the US where the FBI doesn't have any jurisdiction. And also, because it's the internet, as soon as one gets shut down, they can turn around and open up another one immediately. Mm -hmm. So it's like playing whack-a-mole with these guys. The best way to solve the problem, don't become a victim in the first place. Well said, well said. To me, that, that has always seemed the issue. If, um, if someone, you know, there was, used to be a, the uh, caricature of, of the hacker was a, the 40-year-old that lived in mom's basement. And, and there are some 40-year-olds that live in mom's basement that have nothing better to do. But, but a hacker comes in all shapes, sizes, and forms. He can look like you or me. He can be a kid down the street. Uh, he, can be, uh, he can be the guy in a three-piece suit that looks like he leads a... a a, a corporation overseas. He can be anyone, anywhere. Uh, when I talk to people about passwords and they tell me, oh, I had one tell me they used Gaelic to put it in. Well, believe it or not, there are Irish hackers too. The hackers exist everywhere. So, so being more astute, being more educated in that is something that I feel we've, we've got to do more of. Uh, but where I was going was, was legal. Uh, 
if somebody does that to you, if it is the kid down the street or the 40 year old across town in his mom's basement that hacks into you, there's laws. We can prosecute that kid. And I can come up, I know you can come up with more cases where the FBI has successfully found people and successfully prosecuted them and, and they're doing time. But if they're in any other country, maybe Canada and, and Great Britain would be the exception, but just about anywhere else on the planet, as long as they're not attacking their own people and they're attacking us, nothing's probably going to happen to them. You might shut them down or might get them shut down, but, but they're not going to, we're not going to extradite somebody because he attacked you and me. Um, we've got to take care and we've got to get educated and learn what to do in these cases. One of the things I had the point of doing in the FBI is working with foreign countries to help develop cyber laws. So, for example, in uh, Kenya and Ghana and Nigeria, there were no cyber laws books, but those governments recognized that they were becoming basically known as the cyber hacking capital of the world. And so they worked with us and we would help them draft laws to enact in their own countries. So now if we in the FBI are able to locate somebody who's overseas, chances are we can pass that information to that government they can make the arrest and they can prosecute the person. That doesn't get your money back though. And that essentially is the problem. So at the end of the day, it's about protecting yourself. The other thing too is the FBI or the federal government and even the locals are not always gonna be able to help you because resources are what they are. If you've been hacked and you've lost money, but meanwhile, I've got to work with this terrorism case and I have this national security matter and I'm trying to keep the electric grid working here in Arizona, I may not have the resources to dedicate to your endeavor, which is just as important to you because it's your business and livelihood. Right. You still have repercussions and pro, uh, actions you can take. You can uh, hire an attorney, you can get somebody who does forensic, and you can sue the person's sleeve for what has happened. But again, that's assuming that the hackers here in the US I will tell you, I have seen many hacking cases where it was your competitor and they found that the best put you in business was not to be more competitive, but was simply to knock you out of business in the cyber world. It happens and you can protect yourself legally, it does. Yeah, corporate espionage is probably more alive and well than it's ever been, thanks <laughs> to technology. I mean, it's just easier. So, and it's cor corporate espionage, not just from your competitors. Going back to the foreign countries again, it's a lot easier to steal our information than it is to invent it on their own. So we see a lot of countries targeting U.S. business persons because they want to steal what they have. Another piece of advice I have for your audience, if you travel overseas for business, don't bring a laptop with all your important information on it. I like to bring a laptop that has nothing of what I need, basically software programs, et cetera, something to get on and check my email. There is a very good chance that computer can be compromised when you're outside the hotel room. I actually have videos that I show where we've set up hidden cameras and when the person leaves the hotel room, FBI agent pretending to be a business person the hotel personnel go in, they search everything, they make a copy of the hard drive because they're working on behalf of the government of that country. Mm -hmm. You have to be careful of what you're doing whenever you go overseas. Excellent, excellent. I wanna take a quick uh, pause for station identification and then we'll be right back. Great information. And I hope everyone's enjoying listening to the Information Playground. Uh, I'm Ron Bush. Ron Bush Consulting is underwriting this program for WVLP. WVLP is a, is a community radio station, not-for-profit, uh, in Valparaiso, Indiana. And I know they would love, for those of you that live there, they would love for you to take a, a listen, take a look at their website. Uh, we're hosted there or broadcast there every Monday at 9 a.m. and every Friday at 1 p.m. Uh, please turn in to us or tune in to us at 103.1 FM or WVLP.org uh, uh, to stream us from there. We're also on demand on uh, most of the podcast channels, all of them that I'm aware of, uh, uh, probably Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts are the most popular. 
but I believe we're on all of them. Uh, the Information Playground is the name of the channel. And we're also on YouTube under the, the channel uh, name Information Playground, The Information Playground. So tune us in, uh, subscribe to us if you like the program, and let us know. You can uh, catch me, Ron, at ronbushconsulting.com. Uh, our website is ronbushconsulting.com. Uh, check us out. Let us know what you think. And if you have questions, uh, let me know those as well. Uh, John, uh, do you have uh, any, uh, um, any way, how would you like people to approach you? Let's start there. If they have questions or issues. Well, first of all, if you're going to approach me, make sure you stay six feet away, at least for the next <laughs> month. But once that's over, come on up and say well. But I would tell you, if you want to get in touch with me, I'm an easy man to find. FBIJohn.com. Follow me on Twitter at FBIJohn. You can give me a call at my office, 866-FBIJohn. Great. Great. So um, we've, we've covered a, a lot of ground, uh, and I'm glad you brought up travel. Um, even domestically, years ago, uh, I wrote a, a column for, uh, I wrote an article for the Northwest Indiana Times, and it was on the Dark Hotel. Uh, this is a group, at that point, they had not been caught. They'd been operating for about a dozen years. I haven't kept up with them, so maybe FBI has, has found them since then. But they, their modus operandi was to hack into a hotel, which, of course, Marriott's uh, recent hack uh, of, uh, I think, 5 million uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, people that stay there. Uh, just a few years, a couple of years ago, I think, it was 500 million uh, that uh, they had been operating in that group, the Starwood group and Marriott, for four years without uh, being discovered. Um, but the dark hotel would go to, uh, would hack into a hotel. They would find out who's coming to stay. And they were really interested in sea level executives. They were interested in politicians, military, anyone like that. I, you know, I can't tell you what country there are. Maybe you're familiar with them and know more about them, but they're one of those groups that there just wasn't that much known that I had access to information. And uh, what they would do is uh, they would uh, have a pop-up as soon as you check in, check your, your email if you're on the, the, especially if you're on the hotel uh, Wi-Fi. And again, I tell clients never use public Wi-Fi. Don't use hotel Wi-Fi. Don't do any of that. But it immediately will come up. You've got a, 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 an Adobe update that you need to apply it or Microsoft, whatever. And of course, when you click, and most of us click before we think, um, as soon as you click that, you've just installed a virus, which now is resident on your equipment that when you go back to work, now you infect the network. Uh, if they can't catch it, if it's a zero day exploit, a new, uh, a new virus that's unknown. So it, it, it causes just an amazing amount of problems just going into a hotel and, and they specialized in five star and, and resort hotels. Any experience in that area or thoughts? Absolutely. And of course, they specialize in the five-star hotels because I don't want to steal from a poor person. Yeah. I want to make sure I steal from somebody who's plenty wealthy. You're traveling, whether it's abroad or here in the United States, you're absolutely right, Ron. You don't use the hotel Wi-Fi. Use this. You got yourself on your cell phone a hot spot. Most people don't recognize that. Go into your settings and look at the hot spot. Turn that on. You can get all the internet access, internet access you need right from your own cell phone, carrying around a little My5 device. And it doesn't cost you anything extra. You're already paying for it anyway. Why use the hotels? Because if I'm a sniffer, and that's basically working off a computer with a software program, I can go on the Wi-Fi. I can see everybody else who's on that unsecured hotel Wi-Fi. And I can actually sniff into your computer, see everything you're doing, download documents, download your passwords, get me into a banking account like I talked about before, especially you never want to use their Wi-Fi to log into anything that you wouldn't want anybody else to see. Be safe. Use your phone as a Wi hotspot. Even better, encryption. We there's programs out there that are free. You can download it up 
And every time you want to send an email, it's encrypted to the other end. That way, nobody can get access to your information. The reality is you wouldn't leave your car door unlocked. You wouldn't go to bed at night without locking your home. Why would you leave your computer with all your valuables or everybody else in the public? Well said. Uh, that takes us to uh, zombie bots because once you do that, you know, if you're not using it at two in the morning, the hacker that has his uh, back door on there and, and his program's on, he's probably using it at two in the morning. Botnets. Uh, let's talk about that for a while. Any any stories or background on that? Lots of stories. So <laughs> for those who may not be familiar, botnets are basically computer robots. And what somebody will do is they will hack into a computer and that we, they'll make that computer the command and control to go out and hack into other computers. And by using all that computer power, they can try to hack into other locations that have strong security. My little old MacBook Pro is not gonna probably get me into the Pentagon, no matter how hard I try. But if I launch 10,000 computers working at a botnet, I can break into companies, get access, and they do it by running programs that have algorithms that will try every password under the sun to get into the system. You don't want your computer to become part of the problem. So you have to make sure that you're keeping your computers safe. Malware is out there, and sometimes that malware is designed not to steal from you, but to operate your computer to steal from other people. Make sure all your patches are up to date. Make sure you have antivirus software, and make sure you're running that software. I have seen people decide because, oh, it's interference, I'm trying to do something. It's working for a reason. It's looking to clear up the problem. Don't download things on your computer that you're not going to use. Go through your applications. If you have programs that you never use, get them off your computer. Because if those programs are hacked, then they have access to your computer through that means as well. Make sure you're taking care of it. Again, if somebody lost your house key or somebody broke in your house using your key, you would change your locks. Make sure you're keeping computer safely and running that antivirus square on a regular basis. Well said, well said. I read in uh, the size of some botnets, uh, I remember, I think it was 2012, Parmi Olson, who's a reporter for Forbes, wrote a book, We Are Anonymous. Mm -hmm. uh, Anonymous is the hacktivist group. Um, she reported that I think the the botnet that took down um, Visa was 50,000 uh, computers uh, hooked together. 75,000 took down, it was either PayPal or it might have been the church. They took down several large corporations. The Church of Latter-day Saints was one of them. Uh, one of them required 75,000 computers in a botnet to take it down. Um, I've read recently of one as large as of 125,000 computers. 125,000 computers, there isn't anything you can think of to do that you don't have the processing power to do that's capable at all. It's possible. It just, it amazes me. First, it amazes me if these people weren't bent on doing evil, what kind of good could they accomplish? Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing that it amazes me is we just keep, to, to some extent, we just keep ignoring the obvious. Um, I, I do presentations to employees and I do present, public presentations. And when I do, I can watch the people in the audience and their eyes get big. Um, I talk about passwords and pass, strong passwords. Over a decade now, pa some form of password has been the most popular password in America. So password one, two, three, or password with an at sign and a zero mm -hmm. instead of the A and the O. And it still is. All the stuff that's happened, and, and it, it, it just amazes me, it's still the most popular password. Let me in, QWERTY, um, dragon, uh, monkey. You, you can't spell a word. You can't spell a name, and you can't use consecutive numbers. You need long and strong uh, the advice I give, and I prefer 16 character as a minimum, and I know that's a bear to remember. It's even worse when you make it uh, upper, lowercase, special characters and numbers random generated. Some people like phrases, and those are easier to remember. 
but it, again, with enough power, you can hack anything. You can guess any password or, or hack any password, but don't make it easy on them. Don't make it your wife's name and your birth date or, or anniversary date. You know, I would suggest uh, I use a password keeper. Yes. And so with my password keeper, and there's a lot of good different brands out there, one's as good as the other, but these password keepers, what they will do is they will store the URL and they'll store your username and they'll create the password for you that is extremely complex. So if I want to go into my LinkedIn account, for example, all I have to do is open up my password keeper and click on LinkedIn. It'll load the URL, the username, and that complex password. How is it safe? Well, the password keeper is encrypted mm -hmm. and I only need to remember one password to get into that password keeper. So I probably have at least a hundred different websites that I access on a regular basis for various things for business. All of those are in my password keeper. Every one of them has a different password. So if one gets hacked, not by me, but say that company's hacked and my information's compromised, they don't have my password to anything else. They had that one password that I'm gonna change. By remembering the password keeper, it controls everything. And that's another thing about passwords, Ron. If you come up with a complex password, don't use it over and over again because eventually passwords will become compromised. That's why I want you to change them every 90 days so that way even it may have been hacked, but you might not find out about it for two years. This way you've updated your password, you have a fresh password and everything you have is safe by doing and using a password keeper makes it very easy. And uh, what are they, like a dollar a month they charge for password keepers? Very economical way to keep yourself safe. Yeah, and I always encourage folks to, to buy, not use the free version. It is, it's uh, the most expensive ones are probably $50, $60 a year. Um, it, most people, if they drink coffee, they spend more than that in a month on coffee, especially if they go to certain coffee places that I won't name. So, I, uh, I never buy coffee from any place that has bucks in the name. <laughs> well said. So it, it doesn't make sense to, to be able to spend money on virtually anything except protecting yourself. That's where you need to start. And it's very reasonable. It, we talk about uh, password managers, and I usually th throw out three of them. I like uh, Dashlane, LastPass, and RoboForm, but there are a dozen other excellent ones. And you can, you can locate those on the web. Uh, be careful, of course, where you go. Uh, but but find, uh, you know, find the top 10 password management software or programs, applications, whatever. Uh, you can Google it. Uh, I tend to use DuckDuckGo rather than Google. I think it's a better search engine. It's a more private search engine. I don't know if it's better. But it, uh, they claim they do not track you. And I guess I have to take them at their word. There's a lot of people that uh, probably watch them. Um, VPNs, another area, virtual private networks, another, another thing not to skimp on. And it's also around, around 50, 60 bucks a year for most of them. Very economical, very easy to do. Uh, that will encrypt your, your connection. Um, let's talk about, uh, antivirus, anti-malware, another, another product that's really inexpensive, 50, $60. I use, uh, I, I, I usually recommend uh, three of those. Uh, Bitdefender's excellent. Of course, Norton's been around for a long time, McAfee, uh, Webroot. Uh, there's just some great ones. Um, there's no reason not to buy them. If you do the free one, you're going to miss something on any free version of anything that makes it worth buying. And that's either in the case of, past, uh, in the case of uh, antivirus, that could be updating every day, that could be automatically running. Uh, what are your thoughts on it, John? It's always amazing that people will spend all sorts of money on a computer, but then skimp on the virus scanning software and things like that, because, well, I just spent $1,000 on a laptop. I don't want to spend another $100 recognizing it's like buying a car and saying, I don't want to put gas in it. Yeah. You're not going to get anything out of it unless you take care of it. Yeah. So there's a lot of good programs out there. There's 
some programs I'd be careful about. Uh, you know, some of these programs, for example, are manufactured in Russia and the Russian government is involved in everything. So I'd be careful before I uh, download a program that originates from Russia because maybe it's doing its job, but I would bet that someone's looking at your information anyway. If you're somebody who is a uh, significant person in your corporation, etc., you may want to heighten your level. So for example, I use a boutique uh, firm for my uh, software protection and my computer protection. They download their version of everything. They scan my computer and it's that extra step that I actually have eyes on. I will get an update from them seven week by email, personalized me, say, hey, be aware, we found this, we, uh, we need you to delete this, or telling me everything's fine, there's been no abnormalities. For the cost I pay, it's more than the average person, but if you're an executive in a company or you hold a critical position, having that extra set of eyes that is carefully monitoring everything and they know all my devices for the price, it's worth it to me. It gives me that peace of mind. Excellent. Great advice. I want to take another pause and just remind everyone you're listening to the Information Playground. Uh, we're speaking with John Iannarelli, uh, at, uh, retired FBI agent. Uh, we are having a great conversation on staying safe especially in this uh, pandemic environment. If you're listening to us on Monday morning at, uh, at nine o'clock in Northwest Indiana, you're probably tuned in to WVLP 103.1 FM. Uh, you may be streaming us from, from WVLP.org's website. I encourage you to go, go there. It's an excellent radio station and they do a lot in the community. If you're listening to us on demand, it's probably uh, uh, either a podcast on uh, or it could be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or a host of others um, under the Information Playground. Or you might be watching us on YouTube. Uh, John is very photogenic and uh, he's got the sharp blue blazer on, so he's looking sharp. I've got the, the face for radio, but he's looking sharp. So at least you get a good, uh, a good glimpse of uh, a handsome guy. Uh, that YouTube channel is also called the Information Playground. So. Um, Join us on demand or join us on Mondays and Fridays. Um, if you have questions, uh, thoughts, email me, ron at ronbushconsulting.com or uh, check out my website, ronbushconsulting.com. John, if you would tell folks one last time uh, how they can reach you if they're interested. Thanks, Ron. So I'm very proud of the fact that I have a terrible business model. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I have nothing to sell you but I encourage people to reach out and give me a call. If you have a question, a concern, you become a victim, I will point you in the right direction of what you need to do free of charge. I'm in the business of keeping people safe. You can find my website, fijohn.com. Follow me on Twitter for a suggestion every single day on something to keep yourself safe. Twitter at fijohn. And you can call me, 866-FBI-JOHN. And Ron, we're talking about all these safety things. If we have time, I think we should discuss just a little bit about credit monitoring and maybe even cyber insurance for some of your listeners. Excellent, excellent. Let's go there now. We've got about 10 minutes. So credit monitoring, you need somebody looking at your credit because there's all these different things out there that can happen. And I've heard people say, well, you know what, if my bank's compromised, they're going to know. They let me uh, know that I was compromised and they gave me a year of free credit monitoring. That's great if your bank is, although I would hope it's not your bank because that's another problem. But most people are not compromised in their bank. They're compromised in so many different ways. So they will lose their information. And since it's not a financial institution that's been compromised, they have no way of knowing they're a victim. There's all these different services out there that can do your credit monitoring, look at all the credit pros, make sure that there's no unauthorized activity and it's pennies on the dollar. I have a service that I use that I only get charged $3 a month for them to monitor all my credit. And for bigger companies that want to use that kind of service, 
they literally charge, I think it's around 50 cents an employee. So it's something that companies can offer to everybody. And it not only monitors my credit, it monitors generations. It's looking at my parents and my children. If I have grandchildren, I'll look at them as well. So it's a great way to keep yourself safe. You need that set of eyes. The other thing about your credit report, I would advise you, if you're not going to be making a major purchase, you're not getting a new credit card, you're not buying a car or a house, what do you need your credit report open for? Lock, contact the credit bureaus free of charge or 800 numbers. Tell them you want your report locked. That way, if anybody does steal your credit, they don't want anything with it because they can't take out a loan or something in your name. All you have to do is lock when you're to make a major purchase like a home or a car, there's a nominal fee to do that, but then you can lock it up again. And finally, think to your kids. Have you checked your children's credit report for those under 18? If I steal your credit, you're going to know about it pretty quickly. You're going to get a notification that I've stolen your personal information. If I steal your six-year-old's information, their social security number, et cetera, you're probably not going to find out that that child grows up and goes to college. I had a case in the FBI with a young lady. Her credit was compromised when she was nine. By the time she went off to college, half in debt that she had run up under her name, as well as a criminal record by using her information as false identity. You want to make sure you're watching the credit as well to keep everyone safe. Gosh, that is very well said. That's uh, you covered a lot of ground there. So we talked at the end there about child identity theft. At one time, that was uh, the fastest rising white collar crime in America. I don't know if it still is or not. Um, it's probably been replaced by health insurance uh, uh, identity theft. Um, let's talk a little bit, looking at health care. Um, let's talk a little bit about that because that's the healthcare industry is probably the most attacked industry. Um, financial services and them might vie for first position, but there's not a lot of space between them. Um, I think the reason for it, you can buy a social security number or a credit card on the dark web for a dollar. Uh, you can get, it, it'll set you back 50 to 75 and up to, I've heard of as high as a thousand dollars for an electronic health record. That's because the, you get so much from a hacker standpoint, from a criminal standpoint. You get the financial as well as all the health information. So thoughts on that? So healthcare and cyber crime are one and the same and it's becoming a real problem in this country and elsewhere. So first of all, it's stealing your health records. We in the FBI are actually seeing life and death issues as a result of this. So for example, if someone has compromised your health record and they're using your insurance and pretending to be you, what if you're getting treatment for something that could negatively be impacted by some criminal out there using that same information? Uh, we've had situations where people go to the hospital and because all medical records are electronic now, they're uh, deemed, oh, they need to be treated with this particular drug. Well, that was really the criminal who compromised the health records and they're now injecting something into you that they shouldn't be injecting. Likewise, there are some incredibly evil people out there, persons who are diabetics and they have pumps that are electronic and operate off of Wi-Fi with computers and cell phones. We've had hackers try to hack into the pumps to increase the amount of insulin being discharged or shutting off the in insulin when the person is in need of it. They do this for no other reason at all than they can. So it's another reason the FBI takes this healthcare so seriously in the cyber world, but you have to protect yourself. If you're somebody who has an illness and you're doing some sort of treatment that involves the computer, the internet and Wi-Fi, all the more reason you have to have yourself protected so that way you don't become a victim. You have to guard your personal information so it doesn't become compromised and someone takes advantage of your health records and your insurance benefits that can cause you a physical problem, ju not just a financial problem. Excellent. So one last thing, I'm afraid we just have a, a few minutes left, a couple of minutes, uh, cyber insurance. 
let's uh, let's cover that before we end. Great. Well, in cyber insurance, there's a lot of different policies out there that you can get to insure yourself and your business in the event you become a victim of cyber crime. And I would say, depending upon what you do for a living, you might want to take a look at the cyber insurance as a precaution. However, the underwriters are very smart about this, and there's a lot of exceptions to cyber insurance. So, for example, if you in any way are the cause of the problem that resulted in the hacking, you didn't have your computer up to date, you didn't have antivirus uh, software in place that was current, if the hacking was a result of you, you're not going to be made whole. It's like burning down your own home and then trying to collect for fire insurance. So it's great insurance to have, but it can be difficult to collect if you're at fault. So you have to make sure you understand the exceptions. Likewise, just as important as cyber insurance, think about if you have a business where if you're compromised and you lose all the personal information of your customers, your clients, everybody else, you have a legal obligation under the law in all 50 states to report that to the consumer. How are you gonna do that? Because every state has a different law. There are companies out there that you can call in and do it for you. Again, you may not need them to, but it's good to know who they are because if it does happen, you want to be able to pick up the phone and pass that off to somebody. That can be part of your whole summer insurance plan to make yourself whole. I've got all that information. Give me a call and I'll pass it on. Great. One last time and, uh, and we'll end with this, uh, how they can contact you one more time. You can contact me very easily, my website, fbijohn.com. You can also follow me on Twitter at fbijohn and my toll-free number, 866-PI-JOHN. Excellent. John, I, I really appreciate you being on the program today. Uh, it's been exciting for me. Uh, we kind of come at every, every bit of this the same way. So uh, I really appreciated all the answers and the back and forth. And I appreciate the work you've done. You spent your life doing and you're still doing. Thank you for that. Um, Ron, thanks for having me today. And uh, hopefully uh, some people out there will be just a little bit safer as the time we spent together. Couldn't agree more. I appreciate that. So thank you folks for listening to the Information Playground. I hope that you'll join us every opportunity. Um, as I say, we're broadcast on Mondays and Fridays at WVLP or on demand on podcast or YouTube under the channels, the information playground. Thank you. I hope you have a great and safe week.